Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity we have to come together, to reason together, to understand your word better. And in standing in the position I stand here this afternoon, it's a very heavy responsibility. And I do take it seriously, Father, and I, I know that you take it extremely serious to, to rightly divide your word. And so we ask that you will give us understanding and wisdom to know how to appropriate answers for the questions that we have. And I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, please, please find a seat as soon as possible. And I need you to be quiet and if there are children running around, I need the parents to find the, the children. Okay. Well, we had questions the other day, and I have one for today. I'm saving the best for last. But this question says, may I sell my, and I, I paraphrase some of these questions down to make them simpler and, and faster to go through. But it says, may I sell my ancestral property to get money to move to the country? Leviticus 25, 23 and 1 Kings 21, 3 are used to discourage me from doing this. So let's look first at Leviticus 25 and verse 23. It says, the land shall not be sold forever, for the, for the land is mine, for ye are strangers and sojourners with me. 1 Kings chapter 21 is the story of Naboth's vineyard when Ahab wanted to take his vineyard for uh, an herb garden. And he says, well, I can't sell it because it's belonged to my ancestors. I want to ask you a question. I don't think any of us disagree that there are great lessons and lessons of principle to be learned in what we would call the Levitical laws. But do we still keep all of those laws today? Do we? Well, for example, in Deuteronomy 22 and verse 8, it says, when thou buildest a new house, then thou shalt make a battlement, that's like a, a wall, for thy roof, that thou bring not blood upon thy house, if any man fall from thence. I don't know how it is here in Kenya, everywhere. I haven't seen anyone walking on their rooftops yet. Maybe they do that in some places, but in America, we don't do that much anymore. But in the ancient Orient at that time, they had houses with basically flat roofs or nearly flat roofs. And people would go up on those roofs many times to rest or to sleep, just to have more room. And the idea was that you were to put a wall around the edge of the roof so that someone couldn't accidentally fall off. So is there a principle there? Yes, there's a principle that our homes should be safe. We shouldn't have like exposed electrical wires that children might grab hold to, right? We shouldn't have a place where the flooring is so unloved that someone could trip and fall easily. And that's the principle. So I'm using this as a principle illustrator to show that while all of those laws had a good purpose in their day, and they had a principle even for us today, it doesn't mean that we are to follow them to the exact letter of the law. Now, did that have, did it have, if you please, a principle that we can learn from? Well, you know, there's another text in Proverbs that says, don't move the ancient landmarks of your father, right? It's the idea is keeping everything where it was because God was wanting to teach his people to be a separate people. And he was wanting to teach them and, and give them a principle that we should know today is that when we have landmarks and boundary lines that we don't cross them, we today have pillars of our faith. And God does not want those pillars moved, friends. But the apostle Paul in Galatians chapter five, and verse 3, he says, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Now, I don't know what it's like here in Kenya. Haven't been in the room with any of the men that aren't clothed. I don't know if the men here are commonly circumcised or not commonly circumcised, or if it's of some of both. But you know, in the day of the Apostle Paul, it was a big issue, because all the Jewish people had to be circumcised. And there were certain people who were saying, this is a requirement for Christians. And Paul says, no, it's not a requirement for Christians. Now, he never said it was wrong to be circumcised of itself. But he says, if you're doing this because you believe you must do it to fulfill a work of the law, they may as well do the whole law. You've got to do every bit of it. And, of course, he was saying 
in into the book of writing in Colossians chapter two, that that was no longer necessary. <laughs> Certainly. Certainly our pioneers didn't accept this philosophy that we shouldn't sell our ancient landmarks or ancient properties because they bought properties of other people. And if it had been wrong for them to have sold their property, it would have been equally wrong for them to have bought someone else's property. Some of you have seen pictures of Ellen White's final home uh, called Elms Haven near Hellsburg, California. Beautiful place, but it belonged to someone that was totally out of her family when they bought it. No one, no family relationships whatsoever. And I'd like to just say one more thing. I, I come from a country and specifically an area of our country where families are very important and families should be important. And sometimes where I live, in the area where I live, if, if the parents have a large piece of land and they have a house, and they may have, let's say, three sons. They will give one of the sons a piece of property here, another son a piece of property here, another son a piece of property here. And they do that partly to help the sons, but partly because they just want to keep them close to them. There's nothing wrong with that of itself. But remember this, the Bible says that for this call shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, right? So sometimes, friends, it's good to have family nearby. And I'm going to tell you, for the sake of a marriage, sometimes it's very good not to have family by. Because sometimes the family wants to try to control the new family, the old family. And friends, you know, they wanted to be a young couple one time, and you want to be a young couple one time, and, and you need that, to have that right. So sometimes people use these kind of, kind of verses to try to keep people where they're at as opposed to really letting them go. And this verse dealt specifically, or this question dealt specifically with the idea that, that there were very few resources among this family, and they would have a very hard time getting the money to move to the country. But if they could sell their land, they could move to the country, but the family doesn't want them to move away. And that may be more, more than just not wanting them to move away, as opposed to following a biblical injunction. Question number six. And I got this question twice from yesterday. Is it proper for a woman to help administer the Lord's Supper? And I guess this was asked in light of the fact that our sister deacon has helped on Friday. And we would certainly say that the breaking of the bread, the praying for the emblems is a job for the ministers. I don't think any of us have a question about that. But what about the covering on the table? Again, this is my first communion in Kenya. I don't know your customs that well. I know in the United States, when we have the emblems on the table, we usually like to have them covered with a clean white linen. And it's usually the job of the deaconesses, the women, to remove those coverings and maybe even uh, uncover the emblems from their containers. In Romans chapter 16, well, I should tell you that the Greek word for deacon is deaconos. In the Greek, it is deaconos. Okay, don't forget that. The Greek word for deacon is deaconos. In Romans chapter 16 and verse 1, Paul says, I commend unto you, Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church. And that word servant is deacon on. It's simply the same word, only a feminine form of it. Okay. When it's talking about the men, it uses one form of the word. But when it's talking about, it's using the same word. The only difference, the only difference is it is in a feminine form. And you have to understand that English is not like Greek in many respects. In English, we don't have a lot of gender-based words. What do I mean by that when I say a gender-based word? Like, if I think of the Bible, is it a he or is it a she? It's just an it, right? But if I said, here is a, here is a ship, there's a boat out here, we might say she is a nice vessel because boats tend to have a feminine gender associated with them. There's not many words in English that do that, but just a few. But in Greek, many, many words, the majority of the words are either masculine or feminine. Some of them are neuter. They don't have a, a masculine or feminine trait, but the word deacon does. And there's a word for male deacons and a word for female deacons 
And we get that word deaconess from that. And so she was one who did that. Now, again, I want to ask you a question. Why do we do what we do? Why do we do what we do? You know, in, in the Bible, there's very little said about the Lord's Supper. Very little said. There's, there's no protocol given in the Bible for how the table is to be laid out, how the bread is to be made. We just know it's unleavened bread. You know, there's that protocol, but beyond that, we don't know. I've, I have served at literally hundreds of communion services. I serve a communion at our local church when I'm home, you know, three or four times a year, maybe. But I travel a lot. And every time I go places, many times I'm visiting with brothers and sisters who haven't had communion for years. And they want to have communion. I say, sure. And every time I go somewhere else, the bread's a little different. Sometimes it's real hard. Sometimes it's soft. Sometimes it's thick. Sometimes it's thin. There's no protocol for that. It just has to be unleavened, right? Okay. So the same thing concerning the covering of the dishes, the distribution of the emblems, there is nothing said in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy specifically that delineates every detail how that's to be done. And so, friends, you know, you need to do what you believe is consistent with inspiration. But I would say this, don't quench the spirit. Don't quench the spirit. But here Phoebe is called, if you read the Greek, a deaconess. And that man is servant. That's what the word deacon means. It just means servant. And on Friday, we had our sister and she was helping to serve. And I'm just telling you, this is what the Bible says. Now, one more thing, though. Ellen White was... I believe it was in Australia, and they were ordaining women. They were ordaining women as deaconesses to serve as Bible workers and helpers in the church. And she wrote this. This is in the uh, Review and Herald of July 9, 1895, paragraph 4. Women who are willing to consecrate some of their time to the service of the Lord should be appointed to visit the sick, look after the young, and minister to the necessities of the poor. They should be set apart to this work by prayer and laying on of hands. In some cases, they will need to counsel with the church officers or the ministers. But if they are devoted women, maintaining a vital connection with God, they will be a power for good in the church. This is another means of strengthening and building up the church. That's what Ellen White said. Now we have a really fun question, series of questions. In 1 Timothy 2.8, Apostle Paul tells Timothy that I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. This verse mentions men and not women because women are addressed in the subsequent verse. In my understanding, this verse means that the work of ministering at the pulpit is to be preserved, is to be the preserve of men, the bishop. Therefore, my question is, does this ver verse and others teach so? Does this verse not direct men only and women to pray everywhere? Is, is women leading prayers in churches, therefore, a contradiction to the Bible? It's a good question. I appreciate that question. Well, first of all, the Bible says in first, whoops, in first, I got something wrong, just a minute here. Here we go. In first Th Thessalonians chapter 5, 17, it says, pray without what? Boy, that'd be pretty hard to do if you couldn't pray in church. It says that, doesn't it? Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. This is a command, friends, for both men and women, so it certainly seems that either can pray everywhere. The text in Timothy can also be translated, I desire then that in every place men should pray. Certainly every place includes the church meetings, including ministering at the pulpit, but it does not limit it to that. So it is not an exclusive concerning it. Verse 8 speaks of men lifting up holy hands and not having wrath or doubting, but that word doubting in the Greek means whirling, whirling. Verse 9 begins, in like manner also. Did you notice? I mean, if you look in verse 9, look in verse 9. It says, in like manner also. That means that there's something parallel, not different in these passages. The women are to adorn themselves modestly in verse 9. This is becoming a Christian woman makes them proper witnesses for the faith. But let me ask you this. Does that mean that because it tells the women to adorn themselves modestly in verse 9, that the men don't have to do that in verse 8? 
I mean, is it only for the women because it's addressed to the women? Does that mean I can take off my shirt? I can take off my trousers even here? Of course not. It's not trying to say this is exclusive only to such points. In verse 10, Paul says, instead of women wearing adornments, she is to be adorned with good works. And this parallels the man living a holy life of peace and avoiding wrath or quarreling. In 1 Corinthians 11, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul speaks of the improper way that men and women pray. Get that? We talked about that in an earlier question. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul speaks about an improper way that both men and women are praying. And if there's an improper way for a man to pray, that certainly implies there's a proper way. And if there's an improper way for the woman to pray, it certainly implies there's a proper way for her to pray. Now, we are Seventh-day Adventists, amen? Are we really? I mean, we might not belong to that corporate structure, but we are the true Seventh-day Adventists. Do you believe that? Friends, if you don't believe that, you really shouldn't be here. Right? Okay. Well, one of the things that we believe, one of the things that we believe dearly are spiritual gifts. Amen? Do you believe in spiritual gifts? And do you believe in Revelation chapter 12, 17, Revelation 19, 10? I do too. But friends, if we take a position that women can never pray in the church, then we're going to throw out Ellen White, for she did certainly many times, many times. In fact, I think one of the, one of the nicest testimonies I've ever heard was HMS Richards, the founder of the Voice of Prophecy radio program in America. And he was talking about when he was a young man, he was at a Boulder camp meeting when Ellen White was still alive. And he spoke about her prayer. Before she went to the pulpit, she prayed. And she began, she said, my father, my father. And Richard said, as he heard her prayer, he said, I trembled. I was, he said, I was afraid to look up because I knew I would see God. Now, I believe the Bible teaches that men are to be the leaders of the church pulpit without any question. But I do believe, based upon spiritual gifts and many things that we could look at, that women can indeed not only pray, but they can serve and teach based upon the leadership of the men. In other words, women don't teach without the support and the request of the men. The men request of the sisters to do this when they see that there's a gift there that's being neglected. Now, that brings me to my great question, number eight. You're going to love this one, and you're going to like my answer. Many women speak in church. What about 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35? You all know those texts. You know, let the women be quiet, right? How do we relate to that? Now, let me ask you a question before I go forward. Are we to base any doctrine on one text? So how many remember what Revelation 14, 11 says? Revelation 14, 11, that's in the three angels' messages, isn't it? It says, the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast or his image, right? So I could take that text, that one text, and if I make a doctrine out of it, could I get into trouble? If I don't look at any other verses? Yeah. Okay, that's right. So I want to just remind you of what it says in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. And it shall come to pass afterward. And uh, when Peter quotes this on the day of Pentecost, he, he, he relates it to the last days. That I will pour out my spirit upon all the men in the church. Does it say that? All flesh and your sons only shall prophesy. Your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And that's it. No. Is that no? I didn't stop. So I, I waited to stop too quickly. It says, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Friends, if we choose to take a position that women can never speak in the church, then again, we've got a big problem for Seventh Day Adventists. This is it's speaking at the Battle Creek, uh, Battle Creek Tab Tabernacle. Here she is speaking to a large group at Loma Linda in California. She spoke profusely in the church. Now, this kind of a question, if it's a question you're really serious about, is not easily answered in one text either, not just only in Joel. But what I'm going to do, I've made, I've made provision in this 
PowerPoint than these slide presentations. And the brethren can post it, or they can give it to you. Brother Sammy's got it. But what I have now, I have three different articles. And we don't have time to read through them each. But you can get these articles. There's an article by James White. There's one by Uriah Smith. And then there's finally one by Jane Andrews. These were three of the most intelligent men in our church. And they're all looking at this question from sola scriptura, from the Bible only. Okay? They're not talking about Ellen White. They're not quoting her. They're not saying, well, look at her example. They're looking at what the Bible says. They're bringing in texts like from Joel and other places. And I would encourage you to get this presentation and read through these, um, these and it will help you. Okay? But I, we could read through them right now, but it would take too long because my time is already up for this part. And I need my time for the other presentation. But I hope that that helps some. I know there were probably questions some of you had that you didn't get answered. If there's something upon your heart that we didn't talk about at this camp meeting, but you have a question, uh, at least we didn't talk about in Q&A, um, feel free to talk to me after the meeting. I'll be glad to try to help you. I may not know the answer. You know, no one has every answer. But if I don't have the answer, we'll try to study and find the answer together. Is that fair? Is that okay? Okay, very good. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to make a change here. And I'm going to get ready to talk about something else here in just a minute. In just a minute. Okay. Are we broadcasting now or will be soon? Or what's our schedule on that? We're broadcasting now and we're going. Okay. Okay. Well, we're getting ready to start our next presentation. And I'm glad that you're all here and you're just so awake. And probably some of those topic things helped you to get awake. Um, but before we before we start, I want to have another word of prayer. And then my wife and I are going to sing you a song if that's okay. Is that okay? Can we sing you a song? Okay. Let's have, come on up, Sherry, and we'll have prayer. <laughs> 